Yes. Robert? Robert? Okay, we'll just give um, one more minute uh, for our, for our lead MEP to arrive. Um, unfortunately, she has the, uh, because she's important, when she walks down the corridor, she gets stopped and asked questions. So, that's the Democratic approach. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dimitri. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming to this session of the blockchain conference. My name is Theo Moore, as you can hear. I'm British and I have an umbrella to prove it, so that's my thing. Um, I'll be moderating the event. We have been told we have to stop exactly on one o'clock, which means I think we should aim to finish at five to one. As I said, for those who were here earlier, there will be lunch. It's in a different part of the building, so we will form a group, a bolus, if you will, and we will force our way down to the esophagus of the uh, parliament until we reach where the food is. That's not too elementary uh, a uh, example. So, um, we're here to talk about crypto. Um, it's an important topic. We have five distinguished speakers. Um, what we'll do is we'll start with five minutes from each of them, talk about what's in their mind about what they're doing, what matters to them either in terms of policy making or business. Then we'll go to some questions amongst the panel and then open to the floor. We have, through the wonders of technology, um, a, a live stream. So if anyone feels desperate like jumping up and swearing or throwing anything, please don't. As we will be doing it in public. I can't speak for the panel members who asking their questions. They may just respond that way. So um, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, and we'll start with Emily McKay, um, who, as you know, is uh, one of the leading figures in the parliament with technology issues, and uh, over to you, Thank you so much. Uh, we understood your British from the accent. Thank you. Not from the umbrella. We all have umbrellas in Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the last gift. So we need to cover as the meeting. The first president I got was an umbrella. Um, thank you so much for hosting this event, and uh, I do believe um, the value of this technology is now uh, better understood, even in the European Parliament, but also um, the industry is more open to that, and also the banks are open to that, um, because it, it was a technology that started uh, with the cryptocurrencies, and um, it, didn't, um, it was not understood very well, or the people that uh, started dealing with the cryptocurrencies um, were uh, more controversial, and uh, maybe even anti-systemic. So I think now we are at the, at the point where the technology and the understanding is more mature. Uh, we, we have been working for three years in the European Parliament on the blockchain resolution and um, the blockchain and trade report and uh, the crowdfunding file. So all of that actually is the, um, a good basis for uh, the development of this technology under the umbrella of EU. Um, with the resolution, we managed to have a positive approach. Uh, we succeeded to have um, a majority of, uh, basically, except one, everybody voted for that, which means uh, we had, it has huge support, and the potential of the, the technology is there. Um, the uh, energy and GDPR issues, for example, they are addressed, and uh, we will try to uh, figure ways to overcome them or to work with them or for them. 
because they can uh, blockchain could be a problem, but it could also be a solution. Um, so this is the a good basis. Uh, we talk about uh, the next uh, years to come, 700 million for um, pilots and projects that would uh, we would take the risk to see how the technology can uh, um, scale, if it can be interoperable, if it can actually be useful, because it is an amazing technology, but it's not a solution for everything. Sometimes it's a solution without even having problems. So you can use it to um, address problems that you believe they will occur. So it's very, very interesting. Um, I do believe that uh, since I'm now working on the artificial intelligence uh, file, that the intersection of blockchain and AI uh, will be amazing. It's automation, deep learning, smart contracts in a good basis of trust. I don't know, um, because I, I want to understand how ex how many experts are here. Do you all have the wallets? How many have the wallets here? That's a good percentage. We used to have just like two. <laughs> so um, basically, it's a way to peer-to-peer -peer share value without uh, a lot of, like a lot of friction and intermediation. Um, so for us, it's important, and uh, we hope that with our pilots and our uh, projects. We will make it so easy to use, friendly uh, for users and citizens that they don't even they won't even know that it's blockchain uh, beneath this technology and uh, underlying. Um, so we do have uh, funding from the UK plan um, for the investing EU. We have a budget line for blockchain, so this is financing besides funding. Where we do have a lot of uh, funding also from different sectors through innovation uh, that can be blockchain. We don't have to say blockchain. But be blockchain. Um, so I think we have a good start. I do believe that uh, we have a shrinking role of cash, but it will not, they will not disappear. Um, there, there, is, uh, there are benefits that could be good or bad. I mean, uh, anonymity uh, is not 100%. Uh, uh, maybe it's uh, more anonymous to have cash than uh, bitcoins, because you always have uh, traces uh, there. Um, I know that the central banks are looking to use this uh, the cryptocurrencies uh, for their own benefit or to make sure that they will have better services because I was saying recently I had to make a transaction from Russell I was stuck here for a month and I had to make a transaction of like 3,000, 2,000 euros and um, it was like a last minute thing and I was like, oh my God, it was a, like a Friday morning and I said, look, okay, uh, I think it was a Thursday and uh, the accountant said, please send me the payment because we have to finish before Monday I said, okay, okay, I'm going to send it through the bank account. I said, no, 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 this would take three days, plus the weekend, five days. And I was like, okay, there is a lot of, you know, room for uh, development of blockchain solutions where instantly you can make some payments, seconds, minutes, but certainly not days. So I, uh, the way I solved it was like I called my mom and uh, I said, mom, can you please lend me like 2,000 euros, grab a taxi and go to the accountant. That was faster than using the bank account. Uh, I know. And um, of course, we also have the cross-border payments that are um, more easy to, to do through blockchain. And um, it removes cost, it removes the risk and intermediation. It creates a new form of trust. And as we know, citizens' uh, lack of trust in the system and respect. So I believe with technologies, we make, we can make sure that we will um, have infrastructure that they will be Trustworthy without a lot of intermediation. We could. Uh, we have to make sure that we will define properly if something is decentralized or not, if it's controlled or not. So we will be working with the blockchain observatory, which uh, um, will expand. So its role and its scope will expand, and it will be a permanent structure of uh, the European Union, um, quite independent, and will create an ecosystem for European uh, companies. Um, it will uh, give guidelines, it will monitor the technology, and it would have very close to, to, its, um, to its work uh, experts from, uh, from Europe. Peter is one of these experts. He will be there. And um, we have several others that have a great understanding and have need to understand also the technology. Um, and with the crowdfunding, and I will stop here because I think the discussion will be more interesting. Um, with the crowdfunding, um, we called for an ICO report. 
because it's actually a tool for crowdfunding. So besides the fact uh, that it can be used as a cryptocurrency itself, it can be used as um, an infrastructure platform to get funding through the tokens, but funding immediately on your phone and your laptop uh, with, from people that they don't even need to have a bank account. They can just uh, send some money there and they don't, uh, um, they don't have the problems that the traditional crowdfunding had. We managed to increase it from uh, 1 to 8 million, thanks to Peter again. Um, so I should stop talking and Peter should start talking, uh, but uh, I do believe it's an amazing technology and uh, don't look at the prices. They're falling, but the technology itself has value. Uh, it's very smart, and uh, you have to see what are the services and the, pro the services it provides. If you talk about an ICO and, uh, and the real values that it offers, what is the problem that it solves, and then you will understand if it's good and if it can uh, uh, has a, a good uh, future. Um, so I would say be careful when you invest because uh, we still have to. Um, define properly what is a scam and what is not, where we should uh, um, protect citizens' investors and the companies themselves, to have some legal certainty, to make sure that the team uh, will be responsible for what they say, and uh, also to clear a bit how the GDPR guidelines will adapt to blockchain. Um, this is <laughs> my first statement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much in, indeed. Um, and following on is the uh, heavily trailed Peter Kirstens. Um, so uh, representing um, the, not representing the people, but coming from the background of the Commission. Um, Peter, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, this panel, I look at the title and it was about tokenization. And well, I'm not very good in grammar, but often when you see, when you see that nouns are turned into verbs, you know that you're onto something, and people are now tokenizing everything, crypto-ing everything. So things which are static things are becoming activities. And we see often in internet-related activities that when something moves from a noun to a verb, you're onto, you're onto something. We look really at it from two perspectives. On the one hand, if you look at the technology itself, this is the electric technology, blockchain technology, and the kind of services it develops. We see these trends, so really taking the as a starting point the technology, we see for example developments in payments, if I spoke um, about this. And what really this is doing is it is a next generation payment system that goes beyond the traditional uh, correspondent banking system. If you look at payment systems around the world, whichever way, whichever way you look at them, there are systems of correspondent banking which are pre-funded. And that works, but it has uh, disadvantages. And blockchain technology allows you to move to a different system which will have disadvantages but also have uh, advantages. Um, second is really starting from the technology itself, you see that it offers opportunities for capital raising, raising capital formation, and that's also quite interesting. So um, people didn't start when they wanted to raise uh, capital. They started from, OK, we, we have this technology. What can we do? And they, they developed capital raising instruments based on this technology. So that's the trend starting from the technology. But we also see, more recently, people who look at very traditional financial instruments, <coughs> like the bonds, shares, and say, can we actually tokenize these? So they don't start, they start with something that exists and is regulated and say, can we apply, can we move this through uh, the, the filter of, um, of this uh, technology? And of course, whichever way you look at it, um, if you're at the European Commission, often of course, people ask, well, what kind of, what's your policy, what's your view on it? What, what's the regulation? Should there be regulation? And of course, um, if you look at regulation, that's really what we are uh, looking at. Policy, policy. Okay. If you want a regulation, why do you want a regulation? You want a regulation to control this activity because it is risky. Um, there's volatility. There's investor protection issues. There's market integrity issues. There's money laundering issues. So actually, a lot of issues that make it quite sad. You say, yeah, yeah, maybe we should sort of all regulate this, 
or do you want to regulate this because you need an enabling framework, you need a legal certainty for the participants so that they can act with legality? That's another reason uh, why you may want to regulate this. And the third reason, especially if you sit at, uh, in, in Brussels, is you may want to regulate this because you want to preserve the single market, you want to avoid that member states go in all kinds of different directions, and that irrespective of whether you want to control it or to enable it, you at least want to have all member states walking more or less in the same direction. So that's a third way um, of, uh, of looking at it. Um, and we were actually really looking at it from all three perspectives. Yes, we do um, attach a lot of value to the single market and the capital markets union. This is technology that can contribute to this, so we want to look at it from a single market uh, perspective and preserve the single market. We think this technology is very promising, both in its uh, ability to power next generation payment systems, as I said, but also as a capital formation uh, instrument, and therefore we would want to enable it, as we would want to enable the underlying technology. But of course there are also risks, with confidence questions, uh, best protection, market integrity, fraud, scams, and you want to control for this. At this stage, we said, well, the big question often asks is, are these things financial instruments? Because they emulate financial functions, so, and if you take a functional approach to financial regulation, it looks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it's a duck. But actually, if you really scratch it at the surface, it may not be a duck, it may be more like a goose or waterfowl. But in Noah's R of financial regulation, there seems to be the only place for ducks. And so the question is, what do you do with goose and what about power? Are they left out, or are you going to say, no, no, we're going to, we're going to welcome all animals, whatever, whatever way they look? But of course, uh, before we uh, can go there, we first have to make sure that we have a clear view as to who sits on the passenger list on, on the ark, and what quality do these people have? And that's really what we're doing currently together with European <coughs> authorities, we are looking at two aspects, two issues really. One is the applicability of existing financial services regulation. Applicability is a question of scope. Do these instruments, these tokens, do they meet the definition of a financial instrument under European regulation? Um, the ASAS are close to finalizing their replies on this, and I probably will not uh, be disclosing any great secrets if I say that the conclusion is going to be that some meet the definition of financial instrument and some do not. That's the first question. Um, of course, and if they meet the definition of financial instrument, they are financial instruments and they should be regulated as a financial instrument. But those that do not meet the definition of financial instrument, what do you do? You just say, okay, you lock, you lock the car, you're not allowed in. Or you say, no, no, we want to change the passenger list so that they can come on board as well. That's a question which uh, we need to address. Second is that even if, if there are financial instruments, is the existing rules, are they suitable? Can you actually apply these rules to these instruments that have a different manifestation of traditional financial instruments? And I think that the answer to that question is, if I have to summarize it, that you can apply existing rules to an extent and with difficulty. But it's not impossible. And that question is, should you make it more possible? Should you change these rules, amend them, adapt them, so that it's easier to apply them um, to uh, these, um, uh, these crypto assets, either to regulate the assets or to enable them? So that really is the question um, we're currently facing. But to sort of sum up, our approach is we don't want to vilify this technology. We think it's very powerful. We think there are risks in it uh, and opportunities. We want to seize these opportunities for the single market, for the capital markets union, for our banking union, and control for the risks. Uh, and if we can do this and if we can get this right, this would create a framework that protects investors, that assures market integrity, but that also enables this ecosystem to develop uh, way beyond where it is now and where we may see market valuations that are in the same range as we currently see, that may be much lower than what we currently see, or that may be much, much higher than we currently see. The 
the end of the day, the market valuations just won't be. What we really want to see is these blockchains develop actual applications. But it's not that interesting as to how much Bitcoin is worth. We're much more interested in how much is Bitcoin used. And we put them in the airport, we put them down, or whatever we put them in. We don't really care which one. We want to see them used. We don't want to see them speculating. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerson. Um, well, my name is uh, Martin, to um, the Joseph University, um, and, excuse me, my voice has gone through this, <coughs> and is the next to give us his, uh, his perspective on the organisation of the Thank you. Thank you. Motion passed. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk about this. It's important to, to bear in mind where, where it all started and then how it all started with Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper 10 years ago, the peer-to-peer -peer payment system, and uh, then the Bitcoin, which is often referred to as a currency. And uh, this is why central banks are interested in this, in this topic. Of course, we issue a currency, and we also operate payment systems with this implementation of our monetary policy. And uh, how do we do that? Well, actually, we think it's very important to distinguish between the infrastructure, this is the blockchain, this is the ledger, and, and the asset. I know in the discussion, it's, it's often intertwined, this is, this is often lumped together, but uh, it's, it's important to separate, even if it's difficult, because uh, some uh, assets, crypto assets, are intrinsic to a specific blockchain. But uh, I think it's important from the satellite perspective, because depending on what you're looking at, have a different result. That is why we're looking at uh, the infrastructure that is from the assets. So the infrastructure is the streets and the, and the assets and the cars. No? And there are different kinds of streets, there are different kinds of cars, which makes things not necessarily easy. Um, on, on the infrastructure side, we, we operate in big payment systems. Uh, they are really the backbone of the financial sector. We have a, a large value payment system which processes 1.7 trillion euros per day. So it's really a lot. And, uh, Towards the end of the week, we go live with an instant payment settlement solution. So maybe the case that uh, we will refer to will be solved in the future by a solution that, uh, that we, we can offer, uh, where we offer really real-time uh, payments. And this is uh, really 24 by 7 around the clock and uh, the uh, On the infrastructure side, so the question is, is is blockchain relevant? Does it play a role? So we have to check to what extent it meets our efficiency and safety requirements. Of course, we have high requirements because we offer extremely uh, important services. And we have an innovation lab at the ECB. We experiment with uh, many technologies out there. We started with Ethereum. We have elements called uh, Hyperledger. We looked at many of them to see to what extent they could potentially be used for our services. Um, we work together with your system, Central Bank Community, because uh, there uh, are 28, we're going to be only 27. And uh, we also work from a more global perspective, because uh, this, this phenomenon is on stop at borders. We work together with Bank of Japan, we have a project Stella, where we explore to what extent these technologies could play a role in the, in the future. So this is what we are doing. Okay, so what is the result then of our analysis? We've been doing this for more than two, two years already. Since our systems are extremely big, so we thought for the time, and we concluded for the time being, blockchain cannot be a solution, but we also see the, the, the past tremendous development in these technologies. When we started with the Hyperledger version 0 0.6, one and a half years ago, I mean, it wasn't necessarily, uh, didn't meet our requirements, to put it like this, it wasn't really stable. But when you look at the, at the latest versions of it, it's really, when you see the progress, it's, it's, it's enormous, it's impressive. So I think it's important to, to, to really to continue exploring this technology because the time will, it's my personal opinion, will come when it can be used even for bigger market infrastructure services often by, by bigger players, by big banks and maybe even central banks. The second aspect is in the cars. And here it's, it's, it's even more complicated because when you start discussion, discussing the cars, everyone thinks of the Bitcoin car. Uh, and uh, but there's more out there than Bitcoin, we all know that. There are more than 2,000 crypto assets already. And um, so the, the question is, to what extent do we, do we care? We, the central banks care because of uh, two things. Because uh, these 
Assets are often referred to as a currency. And you know, central bank is a, a, a currency has a specific meaning. Uh, a payment, uh, means of payment uh, has to be rid of account. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's important that these criteria are met, and uh, many crypto assets don't meet these criteria. And uh, we have subdivided our thinking and, uh, and our work into three different types of cars. One is really the, the is the Bitcoin and, uh, and and these kind of crypto assets, high volatility, and uh, central bankers are always concerned that uh, they are the named uh, asset, a crypto asset, and their uh, virtual currency. This is a is it difficulty. Is it really an asset? Is it really a currency? So this is a, a concern uh, we have. We are having, but uh, the, the main concern about these, these Bitcoin and, and these kinds of cars is really that there's no issuer, and this leads to this high volatility. The the, the difficulty is um, that uh, yeah, we, we, we need to have when when uh, when the currency an asset is used on the blockchain, it has to be it has to be stable. So from a central bank perspective, if you look at our website, you find a couple of reports already in 2012. We published our first report on. Crypto assets. You find things in there like uh, maybe some of you still know um, this Second Life, this online video game we had an avatar and so on, and you played with Linden Roller. This is what a serious central bank like the ECB uh, looked at at the time and, and considered as a, as a crypto asset, as a, as a virtual currency even at the time. So and uh, so we, we explore these things already back in 2012. We continue with this, and but we, we concluded that as as long as the market capitalization is relatively low, this is the case. And as, as long as the, the, the links to the real economy are not really well developed, it's not the case. Um, there are some, some Bitcoin futures being traded since December 2017 in Chicago and so on. So there are some, uh, some anecdotal evidence that, uh, that uh, Bitcoin is really used, uh, that, uh, um, that that debt is used to, to finance or to pay or to, to buy Bitcoin, this kind of uh, crypto assets. But it's really it's not, not tremendous. But what we see there in terms of links to the real economy, as long as these uh, links remain low, as long as the market capitalization is low, it's not a real issue for us, for monetary policy, for financial stability, and for the functioning of our payment systems. Very briefly, I mentioned the first car, then I should also mention the other two cars. The, the, the second car is more what, what you what is stable stablecoin these days, so, but there's a real issue right behind. No, there's no real volatility, or there should not be much volatility. Uh, anymore. So this is what, uh, for example, UBS with the uh, with, uh, index startup uh, Clearmatics in, in, in the UK have started and they found this utility settlement coin. Well, that's kind of an e-money. So this, uh, this is something not too far away from what we already have, but maybe more convenient. Fine. So this is, a, is another car which uh, we look at from a central bank perspective and say, okay, it's e-money. It can be sort of e-money and this is okay. This can be regulated, this can be overseen. It shouldn't be a problem. And the, the third car is, of course, the, the central bank digital currency car. When, when, uh, when the Bitcoin discussion started, there was also, of course, the question whether the central bank as such should issue uh, such a currency. And this is, of course, something uh, I think almost all central banks want to do. Mm -hmm. currently exploring it's uh, to a large extent. I think 99% of all central banks doing this from a research perspective. There were not that many central banks really consider implementing this. Even the Swedish colleagues, uh, they are still exploring whether or not to have an e-corner in the future. But this is the third important part. So you see, to summarize, I mean, there are many, many roads and there are many, many uh, cars uh, uh, operating and running and driving on these uh, roads, which makes things complex. So for us, it's important, first and foremost, to separate the infrastructure from the assets and then to subdivide even between the different assets in order to arrive at a, at a clear uh, view from the central point. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so we've we've heard from the Parliament, um, from the Commission, from the ECB, and to use the metaphor of streets and cars, it's time to talk to some of the car guys. Um, so Colin from Canada. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Colin Mayhew, and I'm the creator and founder of a cryptocurrency called Nano. Um, I've been looking at this space for a few years. I have watched on the sidelines for a while, and then after I was unsatisfied with how things were going in the existing cryptocurrencies, I decided to um, code what I thought would be a better cryptocurrency. So now this focus is solely to be a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value. Uh, Long-term, we see Nano as a global currency, a 
decentralized currency offering the fastest transactions, high scalability, and to be environmentally friendly. Um, our mission at Nano centers around the idea that we think it's a human right for people to have control of their own wealth. The ability for someone to store the value of what they work for today and then later exchange it for something in the future is fundamental. And when people can't do this, they can't escape the cycle of poverty. There are billions of people in the world without access to banks and for, for various reasons, and we think that cryptocurrency is a way to solve this problem. So when we start, sat down and started planning this organization, we wanted to have some guidelines on how we internally conduct ourselves. What is it going to take for us to be sustainable in the long term? We realized that building something as sweeping as a global currency um, a global, global cross-border currency has the potential to be a large source of international contention. And the contention would probably be around two points. It would be around monetary policy, and it would be around control of the initial mo money supply. Internally, at NANA, we hold ourselves to a high ethical standard. We recognize that we are not elected representatives, and it would be improper and unethical for us to have significant control over either of those, um, either of those points. Um, and we designed Nano internally to, to not have any control over either of those things because we don't want that control. In contrast, there are private companies, um, blockchain companies, that are approaching various governments um, that have the ability to manipulate the money supplies that they're creating. They do own significant portions of the money that they're creating, and they're approaching governments, they're approaching central banks, trying to get their technology implemented for everyone to use. And we internally feel it's inappropriate and unethical for this to be happening. Um, and I urge people here that have the ability to do that to, to look at the people that are you, approaching you and make sure that their motivations are correct for what they're doing. So even though we recognize there is an enormous uplifting potential for <coughs> cryptocurrency to get people out of their, their poverty cycle to control their own wealth, we do recognize that inevitably it's going to be used for inappropriate purposes. So. Another part of our goal internally is to work with legislators, to work with the judicial system in order to understand how cryptocurrency works, how it can be applied in, into the judicial process, and give them the tools that they need in order to, to track crimes, etc. And that is where our mission is. Thank you very much, Colin. And so now, Mamit, um, over to you. Hi. Um, so I represent Mergo, and Mergo is the commercial inventor arm of the uh, Cardano blockchain. So Cardano is a third generation blockchain, uh, arguably the most scientific uh, blockchain out there. We have over 26 PhDs uh, working full time for us uh, that are building out the, uh, uh, the research behind what goes into uh, Cardano. Um, so our, you know, we're a car. Uh, as as you mentioned, in, in, a, in a way, but I think I see ourselves a little more like the road because we're a protocol on which we are uh, actively encouraging and helping entrepreneurs to build the cars on, build the applications and services on. Um, when we talk about you know this our topic here in terms of tokenization of the economy, um, I think I'd, I'd rather give you a few um, examples of how we've looked at that and what we are doing in that space uh, to give you a sense more in terms of what's happening on the ground um, outside of, you know, a while we wait for uh, governments and regulators to, you know, formally put frameworks and regulations around these activities, there's a whole lot of innovation and activity actually happening on the ground. Uh, I will give one caveat, I am Asia-based. Uh, most of our work is based in Asia currently. I am less knowledgeable about the European uh, circumstances and situation, but looking to learn. So uh, if I say something that's ignorant, I apologize. Um, so I'll give you an example of, you know, uh, say, three uh, entities that we have invested in are encouraging uh, and helping to grow on a blockchain. So one's a company that's taking AI and blockchain together. And the way they're doing this, they're focusing on uh, putting the entire spectrum of loan origination 
all great securitized originators, they somehow work at digitizing this manually. It goes through various checks and balances, you know, dozens of different large lenders. And so it, the, the algorithm has actually understood uh, the probabilities of default and various other characteristics of each of these loans and the users behind them and so on. So from a bad AI engine, <laughs> applies that entire logic back into this new loan and subsequent loans going forward, it's actually able to immediately get a much better sense of the credit risk that this loan particularly has based on who the borrower is and so on. Now, if we take that and immediately match it up with a square view of it, right? So every element of this entire loan is now on blockchain. It's immune, right? It's been recorded for eternity. You can't go back and change it. If you have a data entry error for some reason, well, the only way to change that is to actually have a correcting error further up on the blockchain that would not really reverse the transaction as we tend to do, but would actually just add a correcting entry to the transaction. Now you take this entire circumstance and you bring it into the securitization market, right? With that level of in-depth detail, all the way from origination onward, and if you actually sync this up with the lenders and, and the lenders' entire load management systems are singling into the blockchain, then you have got as much real-time uh, understanding about that individual loan without any intermediary in place, without the need to trust a particular intermediary, a particular financial institution, whatever have you, whatever games they might or might not have happening in the background. It's there, it's on record. Now you take that and you bring it into a securitization market. At the end of the day, you know, I would expect that down the road, this would eliminate the needs for a lot of the intermediaries in this space, which, frankly, and regulators and legislators are a much better place to um, guide me on this issue, but to a large extent, those intermediaries are the ones that cause a whole lot of the problems in the first place for these markets. So knock them out of that picture. Then the next thing is, we've got these rating agencies. Great, they do good work, I guess. Uh, but, you know, if 2008 is anything to go by, uh, there's a whole lot of improvement that needs to be done there. If you actually have at the, you know, securitization level, an in-depth insight into every single loan and transaction immediately, transparently, you at least, I would think, have uh, a means of having a much more uh, fair, transparent, and judicious system in place. So, you know, this is one attempt that we're doing, uh, and it's being built uh, on Cardano. Uh, another one is uh, looking at supply chain. So um, the example here is, so we're, uh, we've got a company that has built an entire blockchain protocol, end-to-end -end supply chain solution on blockchain. Uh, and they have now partnered with one of the largest uh, electronics manufacturers in the world. Um, and what's going to happen here is that the uh, manufacturer and all their supply chains of so their tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers uh, all that entire supply chain data is going to come onto the blockchain here managed by uh, the company that we've invested in. Uh, and the idea there being that once the OEM, in this case, actually has full transparency on what's happening with their entire supply chain, they can actually then leverage their balance sheet and their better credit risk and so on to, in turn, finance all the various uh, T1, T2, T3 suppliers in their supply chain, rather than the current situation where T4 supplier has to wait for T3 supplier to give it its payment terms and credit terms and, and so on and so forth, and their T3 to T2 and so on and so forth, uh, where the person who gets squeezed the most in this entire game is the T4 supplier, T3 supplier down the road, uh, who has the smallest balance sheet, the weakest uh, credit rating, um, but the most onerous terms uh, in terms of financing. So that, you know, that entire business and protocol there provides, again, uh, transparency, a, a, a supreme degree of transparency on what's happening real time through the entire supply chain and allows for cost efficiencies, it allows for operational efficiencies, uh, and it allows for an economy to be built around that one mega OEM and their suppliers. Now, this isn't the end of it. If you take this now and you look at another OEM, and a third OEM and their supplier pools. 
what you have then oftentimes you'll find is, especially in the Asian context, you'll find that a lot of the suppliers in the chain are actually linked across various of these networks, right? These supply chain networks. So if you actually now take that same blockchain and sort of the token that is the transaction medium on that chain, um, you can actually now create almost this sort of parallel uh, financial ecosystem and economy between these tokenized networks, these tokenized supply chain networks, which again goes and bypasses the intermediaries and all the inefficiencies and costs that they add uh, to the system. Um, so so get, before we get to the third example, I think I'll, 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 I'll just cut in. I don't know. No. Um, so let's just stop with a couple of questions to uh, that side of, of the panel. So from the, from the parliamentary perspective and from the perspective of the central bank and from the perspective of the commission, what Colin said for a second about an, an ethical approach to um, <coughs> Does that, does that sound to you like something that you, you haven't considered thus far, uh, that you've been looking at in sort of more pragmatic terms? Do you think there isn't an ethical angle, not necessarily simply on raising people up from poverty, but how companies have a responsibility to use and not abuse the technologies they're creating? And how would you try and factor that into what you're doing with your various institutions, if, if anything? And then I'm going to ask a question based on what I'm going to say. Who would like to go first? Thanks a bit for you, Scully. Yes. So, um, yes, I think the philosophy of the technology started to be um, a technology for good, an ethical technology that would bring back uh, trust. Well, in 2008, uh, the trust was lost uh, due to the economic crisis. And when we failed to make uh, the real uh, people that uh, were the cause actually of the, of the crisis to pay the price and we transfer the burden to the taxpayers. So I think this is when blockchain came as a solution, uh, as a philosophy, as an idea with problems, because it has problems of scalability and it cannot solve the repairability and, and some other things. But actually the philosophy is amazing and um, I wanted just to say that besides the trading thing and the hype of the crisis, the rest has a lot of value, and the technology itself, the access to services, the direct rewards, removing uh, friction, make payments faster, cheaper, uh, easier, and bring more trust. Removing intermediaries, in in uh, you mentioned that uh, there are problems there with them. Of course it is. It's like 130 billion of hidden fees for our transactions. Imagine if you can just remove 10% how many investments you can do. We just have five million for our wars if you use blockchain for social good. So everybody can apply, anybody. Until, uh, I think summer, I don't remember, I think it's uh, summer or end of 2019, okay, Karen knows. So you can apply it online. If you have ideas that you can use, I think basically most of the ideas, they have something good. Um, so you can apply for that, it's just five million. Imagine if you can reduce these hidden costs Ten percent. How much you can uh, boost the economy, create growth, new ideas. Um, blockchain is creating new jobs. Actually, if you think that um, I have a friend, he told me that uh, he asked his daughter what uh, her, what she wants to be when she grows up, and she responded, "I want to be an influencer." <laughs> so this is a job now. It pays really well. A YouTuber. It's another job. So um, imagine if people understand how to use blockchain as, as a tool and use it for YouTube to get rewards and payments for the content. It can be awesome. So it can, it can be a technology that creates jobs, ideas, innovation, and solutions for problems that don't exist, for example, that. So I think, yes, there are ethics there, and that's why I like it and, and actually support it. And of course, everything can be used for good and bad. Um, uh, let's try to, um, to be fast and educate uh, ourselves and also us here in the Parliament and the Commission to make sure that we will protect citizens from, these, um, um, from the bad ones, from the bad guys. I think also the industry was that. So they were telling me the first time I was in an event like this, they were just, uh, actually they were just men. So it was like the first event like four years ago. 
and I was, uh, I thought it was the catering business. And I started, uh, I started, you know, talking. And when they realized I was British, I really felt I should disappear. I was not wanted. And uh, I realized I should like try to understand it because I could, if I said the word regulation, they wanted to kill me. I felt it. And I see that this changed. So uh, basically a year, a couple of years um, ago, I saw that people wanted regulation. And with what happened with Cambridge Analytica, they realized it's better now than later because the good ones, the smart ones, the best ones, they want to have legal certainty. And the price volatility is very connected to the, to the uh, legal uncertainty. Whenever there is a statement from a government against or a bank against, then uh, the prices uh, fall. I don't say it's a connection. As I said, the prices uh, sometimes are reality relevant. But to understand how important it is for us to give them certainty. So before I go and ask uh, the Commission, Colin, you wanted to respond to something that has uh, happened. Yeah, I was just agreeing that um, one of the goals I think that cryptocurrency can bring to everyone is removing those hidden fees. Um, there are a lot of cryptocurrencies that do charge fees. Well, that was one of our goals. It's, was to eliminate that, um, especially for international transfers. There are millions of people that use remittance services, um, Western Union, etc., that charge very large fees. And this is something that can be very easily solved with cryptocurrency. And um, on on the safety regulations type of um, front, yes, we, we definitely want consumer protection on everything. I think, ironically, the amount of regulation that exists has caused some of the issues that have happened in cryptocurrencies because responsible entities can't reliably and, and enter the system to do it. Banks can't go in there and take custody of cryptocurrencies or help these exchanges happen because they have no certainty that they can legally do it. So it's, it's been a lot of rest. So Peter and, and Dirk, uh, is, is the business of good and bad, good and evil, um, is this something that you feel that your respective organizations can, can become involved with, or do you just have to open it up and, and, and trust to other um, processes and structures to weed out the bad and um, promote the, the good? I'll let one of you pick it up and ask you that. Well, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. I think it's a they enhance human and organizational capabilities for the better and for the worse. Depends on what you, what you do with it. So there's nothing inherently unethical about crypto assets, nor is there anything inher inherently ethical about them. They're just a, a tool. Of course, there is a lot of ethical and unethical behavior, but that's separate from the technology um, as such. But what we see is that it was this, the, the crystal asset movement, the blockchain movement, was born out of a disenchantment with the existing financial system and the intermediaries in that system. So if you look at the, the crypto anarchists that supported uh, this movement, it was very much sort of saying, well, we don't really need any of these intermediaries with all their high fees and inefficiencies. We want to have a peer-to-peer -peer system. Fine. And that can that can work, cut out, cut out the middleman. Um, but we see as this technology progresses, we, what we see is not really a peer to peer system. We see a new system of intermediation. Existing intermediaries are reinventing themselves so that they continue to be intermediaries on the blockchain. Or you have alternative intermediaries developing. And they are performing very much the same functions as the traditional intermediaries uh, in the financial system. Now, Financial services regulation, by and large, really is a system of regulation of intermediaries, of regulating financial intermediation. If crypto asset developments turn out to be a new form of financial intermediation, I think it is extremely unlikely that over time they will remain outside the remit of financial regulation, because that's what financial regulators do. They regulate these intermediaries. Why do they regulate these intermediaries? Because these intermediaries 
uh, are the off and on ramps uh, for the systems. They are the ones that are the contact points for investors and consumers, so where those investor consumer protection issues emerge. But also, they are the places where risk balance sheets and so on build up. And um, often, sort of, with, uh, what we sort of see is that in the crypto asset movement, there's a lot of thought that there's no need for a central bank. And probably the system can run for a while without a central bank until you need a central bank. <laughs> And we've seen this uh, before. I say, uh, so, someone, someone has to stabilize the system, and that's why you need um, uh, these systems. The other thing is that if the, if the intermediaries that could potentially build up huge balance sheets and huge concentrations of risks remain outside any supervision, the risk is unknown. It's not because the risk is unknown that isn't there and that the system can't collapse. Now, when the system is and when the system collapses, and it's probably more system, or if the system goes through a crisis, people will start looking at politicians and at regulators and ask them, take it to a crisis, what did you do? Personally, my own view is that at that moment, sort of us saying, well, these aren't financial services, probably isn't going to be a good enough answer. Thank you. So, uh, Dirk, um, central banks are needed, not needed until they are needed. Um, where do you think this, uh, this point of Peter's Exodus in terms of the system being potentially need of someone to, to step in to balance things out? Is that the role you see coming sooner rather than later? I think it's important to, to distinguish the, the vision, which is very important, from uh, what's happening at the moment. Um, the, the vision is, uh, I mean, many enthusiasts they, they, they take a blank sheet of paper, they sketch a completely new world. In the financial sector, it doesn't work. You have the incumbent players. You, you have the financial market infrastructures. You also have the central banks. These are, they have their roles to play. They are, at least at the current juncture, we are here for a reason. We, we, we care about the stability and the efficiency and the safety of the environment that the ECB also care about, as, as all of us here, in, here about financial integration process. So the vision is one thing, and it's, and it's very important that uh, in, in our environment, it's, it's, it's difficult to already speculate on a central bank around that with crystal ball gazing anyway. So um, to, to see what, what will happen in the future, what we see, that, that many people speak about the vision, but what we also see is that many people, uh, despite speaking of the, of the vision, they, they use the technology more in-house at the moment, or with a group of players. So it's, it's not really changing the ecosystem. As we know it, it's more uh, starting maybe a small scale and then see what, what, uh, what happens. So it's more a journey. And uh, so that is why, from the base perspective, all these players, uh, they still the experiment and uh, some of them go live with small scale solutions, but uh, they all have their role to play. Whether this will then be a catalyst for further changes to the ecosystem, time will tell. But as long as we are not yet uh, there, there's a role to play for, for all of us. So, maybe I think you said earlier that many of the problems best in intermediaries. I think that's what you said. Um, but the point was made that perhaps disintermediation is merely the replacement of one set of intermediaries for another, with blockchain being that um, new potential intermediary. Do you think that means that you are going to be the next problem? You know, if that's where the problems start in the middle, and that's where the risk best eventually, what are you going to do? Yeah, I think um, I think we need to distinguish between commercial intermediaries and the regulatory bodies. Uh, my gripe, at least with the extent financial system, is with the commercial intermediaries, not the regulatory bodies as such. Uh, if anything, 2016 and 17 in the ICO hype and euphoria, the crazy madness that happened uh, globally on that is case in point. We need to protect those uh, small retail investors uh, who blindly put money into these schemes, and we need to protect them against those, um, trying to find a polite word, but um, hyper greedy uh, ICO led money grabbers, right? We do need that protection, and it is uh, for the regulators to put the best systems in place because they understand its full impact and have experience in, in, in doing that. But the commercial intermediaries, you know, if you have a system that provides greater transparency, greater efficiency, faster transaction capability, 
uh, and cheaper service, all of this transparently, that can be, you know, KYC to the nth degree all the way back to its origin. Why not? Why not encourage that? And why not actively support that? Um, of oftentimes, at least from what we're seeing with, uh, you know, some of the regulatory agencies and so on in other countries, um, their efforts seem to be more at protecting the incumbents. Uh, or, you know, the efforts are being led by groups where the incumbents are the only members and they get to define what the next playground is going to look like and which technology to use. Even if you think about the technologies you use, half of the blockchains that people mention as the top 10 aren't really even decentralized. They're fully centralized uh, protocols. So one has to go deeper into that to sort of be sure that you're looking at the actual benefits of the technology. Uh, and then giving it a genuine chance to grow. Because if, if, if the regulatory institutions and legislation, legislatory, legislatory institutions don't encourage or take lead in that, then it's private institutions that are going to uh, take that over. And at that point, and at some point, you're going to come to head between these decentralized entities that are breaking the commercial intermediaries and the uh, incumbents. Uh, and that's might not be a pretty scenario, I don't know. So that's a combination of a, an invisible war philosophy uh, between the genuine breakers and those who are merely shifting an incumbent position to adapt to a new, to a new technology. Um, Colin, you talked about working with, with regulators. Um, if you could look at the European Union and say to the regulators, you know, give, me, give me one thing, give me this, you know, what, what, would that, what would that one thing be that would help you achieve your outcomes. Your outcomes are purely commercial, but obviously you have a, an ethical and a moral element in there as well. What can what can um, MEPs, what can people working in the European Union, what can central banks do to help you deliver what you think needs to be delivered? I think what we need is a way for a company to be able to officially and properly say that we are performing this function with the cryptocurrency, we are accepting payments with it, we are paying our employees with it, we um, are taking payments in it, and do it in a way that is compliant. If there is no guidelines whatsoever, it can't even be attempted except in, in gray market areas. So I think just saying that whatever you're doing with money currently, as long as you do an equivalent thing with cryptocurrency, you're tracking it, it's auditable, um, that would be acceptable. That type of assurance would, would really help in the market. So throwing that then to um, Mikitani and others, do, do you think that what, say, for example, conscious output is is realistic? What is what is the timeline? Because if, as Mimi said, there is a struggle going on perhaps between those who are genuinely revolutionary, for want of a better word, and those who are merely adopting a changing environment who are incumbent and this is going to cause a potential disjuncture at some point. Um, time may be pressing. So can we done sooner rather than later? Or are we misunderstanding these things cautiously, one step at a time, perhaps as a, as a more considered approach? I'll leave that open to whoever wants to pick it up. But perhaps then, I can start uh, just by saying that uh, it's already here, the technology. We already see applications. They are already being tested. They are used for supply chain. I think this is where we're going to see uh, value and very fast. Um, so, uh, for example, big fashion brands are using blockchain to make sure that there is the identity and the trademark is there and they can uh, register everything, maybe even with sensors, so that they can track down the original ones from the fake ones. So it's, it's there. They, they test it, they start using it, and uh, I think we will see several applications we see with uh, shipping companies. Um, we, we see in food chain already, they're exploring this possibility um, for fish, for identity of, uh, of uh, packages, um, etc. Et and uh, since uh, I have to speak also on the behalf of the European Parliament and the Commission, I can say that. Uh, the pilots that I mentioned, they already uh, started. So there is funding already. For example, there was funding for uh, blockchain and SMEs. Um, open source blockchain, uh, I told you about the, these awards. There is blockchain, I think, for agriculture. 
Um, we just passed door certified for trade, so we can explore more pilots there. I think certification uh, blockchain, um, big funding will come in the next like two, three months, maybe. Um, and more. So I, I see that uh, it's going to happen fast. I don't say it's going to be perfect because the technology itself is developing and we have to test the which blockchain is better for uh, what purpose. There are countries that are testing it, um, land registry, I think in Netherlands, Estonia is using blockchain, um, in France they have a very good environment now for blockchain, and you know Malta made an effort, uh, Gibraltar has um, um, a holistic solution I think for, for blockchain investments there, um, with the exchange and everything, so they, have, uh, they also can um, give licenses and stuff, so um, I think we see it develops very fast. So if you ask in terms of uh, you know, a more harmonized environment in the European Union, this is not easy. Um, tax reasons and uh, other reasons, different regulations. As I said, we tried with the uh, uh, crowdfunding file to have a harmonized uh, way to use uh, ICOs and common rules, uh, but it will, um, it will come as a separate file now. Uh, so uh, probably before the end of this mandate, we're going to have something. Um, like ways to verify some things, to make sure we're going to give uh, you know, some clarity to, to possible investors or legal jurisdictions, uh, if they're in Europe or not. Um, so I, I can just give you an example of, for the crowdfunding, because I think it could be interesting. So crowdfunding, we used, we used to have um, national crowdfunding rules. Okay? So you could not use crowdfunding to get money cross-border in, in European countries, member states. Now you can, you have an option. You can choose the national one or the European one, whatever fits you best. Um, hopefully we will try to do the same with uh, ICOs. So I think the next year it's gonna be very uh, important, but as I said, we, we expect the technology to develop. We see blockchains that are not mining, they're farming, which means less energy consumption, easier to solve, um, and different blockchains that are very exciting, either for uh, contracts, other for transactions or, or uh, for supply chain. So, at the end of this year, it's going to be interesting. Um, Dirk, you talked about the uh, technology evolving rapidly as well. You said, you know, you previously looked at second life, obviously not what it was. Um, but other technology actual coins you looked at are developing rapidly. Do you think what Collins asked for is, is going to be practical in the face of that rapid evolution, the things you might think you were enabling something, and then um, the technology moves in a direction you can't quite predict? Is it evolving? Is that, is, that, is that a, a thing that you can easily think about, or do you take a uh, more sanguine point of view and say, we'll, we'll wait for the technology to develop and then bring in what Colin is asking for recognition of how these things can be used? I think reading is not an option anymore. No, this is, uh, we live in times of accelerated change, is an obvious statement to make. Uh, this also is also true for central banks. We uh, have to make sure that uh, we in Europe don't, don't hinder innovation. I think in, Contrast, we, we have an innovation team inside the ECB. We uh, look at new technologies, new technology uh, new developments in order to precisely avoid such cases that uh, we, are, we are then uh, kind of go behind the curve and we don't understand what's happening. I think this would be, would be the worst thing that could happen to the financial, for the financial sector in Europe. And our, our, our board member and the board member I report to, Mr. Yves has recently published and given a very interesting speech on European players. He, 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 questioned, he asked whether uh, there's not a need for, for more European players to play a role globally. And these are the kind of questions we have to ask ourselves, whether Europe is strong enough and whether we do enough to, to, really, to be competitive in, in this world. Now, when we speak about uh, the financial sector, uh, our payment solutions, they are normally coming from the US or from China. So the question is what, whether we are well positioned in this field or whether we need to do more. To, uh, to do more. Um, but on, on Colin's point, we, we have, we are, the financial sector is highly regulated. We, we, we all know that. And uh, at the beginning, I mentioned the different cars. So the e-money car, if you wouldn't feel home in the, or you wouldn't think you have a position, a position that is placed in the, in the e-money car, it wouldn't be addressed where, where, you, where you could sit, in which car you would sit, or you would a new car. And that would be for the, for the regulator to decide. But for the regulator, I think, this is first and foremost maybe maybe the commission uh, because the regulation is, is, is done there. So we have the PSD too. We, we have uh, 
the EMD, we have the, the MIFID, the EMIR, the CSDRs, and all this. And if, if they don't fit to a solution, this has to be discussed. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on that neuroplasia point. Well, we try to do our utmost not to regulate any technology because technology is temporarily evolves. Um, if you look at what regulation does, it looks it regulates activities or it regulates intermediaries conducting certain uh, activities, but not ideally uh, the technology. And the activities are evolving quickly. It started off with Bitcoin as a just it wasn't really that much functionality in it, it was just value transfers. But then you sort of saw the wallet providers, and then you saw exchanges, fiat the crypto exchanges, crypto to crypto exchanges, you saw funds, investment funds, derivatives, uh, all kinds of activities around this. And the question always is, well, should it, is activity a regulated activity which is reserved only for certain properly licensed institutions, or should our people be allowed to conduct this, and if so, under what uh, conditions, or is it an activity that doesn't really require um, any regulation? So it's very, it's very much a moving target, but of course that does not mean that we can sort of uh, sit back and wait until the target stops moving and only then it's, uh, it's done. So we keep on moving for quite a long time. The second uh, condition, you need, you need to have some stability, you need to know really what the issues are. The second thing you need for a regulatory framework is political consensus, or at least a workable majority, um, in support of such a framework. And I'm not convinced that at, the, at this particular stage, that consensus or that majority actually exists uh, across Europe or across across the globe. Um, it's it's evolved. About eleven months ago, at the top of the crypto asset bubble, um, any regulatory intervention had it been proposed then would have very likely gravitated around strong restrictions. This is all speculative. The only thing we need to do really is to find money laundering and to find uh, speculators. As the market came down and people sort of start looking into this technology, we see that the perspective changes. So I don't I'm not convinced that at this moment um, the majority view among politicians is one of this is wonderful technology enable this, we should support this, and um, see um, what we can get out of it. Quite a lot of people still assimilate or associate crypto assets with financial alchemy, bad news, fraud, money laundering, and so on. So any treatment that you want to give it is to control those activities. And so when you ask and push for regulation, be conscious of what the predominant view among legislators is at that moment, because that predominant view will be reflected in the regulation that does. Can you ask a question? Oh, please. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the previous we were discussing the early subject of, uh, several times. Um, we, we need new definitions uh, for these new technologies, and sometimes it takes a bit of time. Uh, for, for the system and uh, for everybody to understand the differences between uh, uh, these new technologies and the old technologies. Um, so uh, the approach of the US, for example, when they immediately tried to do something was like everything is a security. And everything has to fit in an old box. And uh, we had a different approach. Uh, we had the approach that some are securities and then we know what to do with them, but um, like 60, 70 percent it's not a security. So we have to do something differently then. And then you have to decide if it fits another box, but I think it's an exciting technology that it cannot actually fit in any box. So you have to create something different. You have to take it one step at a time because you need to have the protection there. Uh, because if uh, one day we go back and say, okay, now everything is security for us too, then you create again, not just distrust, but then the system, I think, because the technology is unstoppable, it will make us seem irrelevant. I think it's going to continue existing, but uh, it, will, it will be a disruption and we will not be able to, to adapt. It's going to be difficult. 
Um, so I think we have a better approach, and I see that even the U.S. is changing now the approach. Not everything is a security. Um, that's why I said we need to define exactly and to give transparency of what is decentralized, how decentralized it is, because this is where trust comes, and this is where the intermediaries are not replaced by new intermediaries. Actually, you have an, an open system for, for people with, uh, you know, with a decentralization that you can trust. And of course, how many users? Because if there are few users, then decentralization maybe is not even trustworthy. But if there are many users, then it creates more, it builds more, um, more trust. So new definitions is what we need. We try to find these new boxes. And uh, we cannot fit everything to the old rules. And um, when I was talking about the social economy, the shared economy, um, we were talking about Uber. And uh, and uh, I remember like three years ago, in a discussion like this, a young girl said, uh, you know, in Spain, Uber is disrupting the, uh, the way taxis work. And it has to be stopped because it doesn't follow the rules. So innovation doesn't have to fit the old rules. We have to be smart and fast to create new rules, and then they have to follow these rules, and then you have to allow innovation to happen and make sure the transition will not destroy, you know, uh, the, the traditional sector. But you cannot stop innovation, and I think this is then how you can be happy. I'll ask a representative of the Spanish taxi industry to uh, counter that in one way. But if anyone wants to say something, I'm not taxi there. So <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, and then I'll have one question about it. Okay, we'll open it to the floor. So if anyone wants to speak to the questions. Yeah, I think the, the question of the regulatory framework um, and kind of what people want to do in order to do things like stabilize the system or uh, enact controls kind of goes to the question um, of which which policies do we take. The fundamental difference in cryptocurrency compared to fiat currencies is that it does not respect or is not restricted by borders. It, it can be sent around the world in a matter of seconds, less than a second. So, so fundamentally, it's not something that can be restrained inside of a geographic area. So then the question is, even though we're debating this today here, we can come up to a conclusion that we want, but does that match with what the rest of the world will do? Whose rules do we get to pick? Um, that's part of the reason why we, we take a take no, um, take no control policy, because then we don't have to have these discussions. There's no control for us, or to, there's no control to be given out. Um, but when we want to regulate these things, we will have to keep in mind that this is truly a global thing. It is not, not constrained to a continent. Thank you for that. So final question for me for the panel, and we'll open it to the floor for questions. A um, couple of comments towards the end there, um, in reference to the question about whether Europe would be able to have this. And we have European sort of policy makers on one side, and we have people in the industry, North American representing Asia as well. I mean, where's the European? Place. And then, given what you're doing in, in Asia, do you see, based on the discussion we've had on us, whether or not Europe is, is behind the curve in some way, or is it making the necessary steps? Yeah, recognize that innovation is not stoppable, but that Europe has to accommodate it in a European way. But where do you think Europe stands in light of Asia and perhaps your wider view of uh, the, the global tokenization uh, movement? Okay, I mean, I don't think I'm properly qualified to answer that. I mean, in the sense that I don't know enough of the uh, the details and nuances where, where Europe stands. In the we talk about Asia. I think you're, you're well, Asia, yeah, but, but I would say that I'm, I'm highly encouraged by what I've heard today. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, um, I, I do fundamentally believe that we need to have some regulation in this space. Um, I do think that you know a lot of the focus should be on something like security tokens, for instance, as opposed to the, the uh, Previous all ICOs and utility token stories, that's where everything is moving because, you know, frankly, any investor in the token space is taking equity type risks but getting some sort of utility type benefit on the other side, which might or might not come about, and so on. So, so there's a lot of work on that front. Now, the thing about the, at least what's happening in Asia with a lot of the uh, regulators and all this, that they've at least done, until they figure out what regulations they want to or not to put or not to put, they've at least set up you know things like sandboxes. So the Chinese have regulatory sandboxes, the Japanese have regulatory sandboxes, the Koreans have it, Singaporeans have it, <laughs> and in those sandboxes they allow the you know uh, they allow innovation to flourish. So they allow you know young entrepreneurs and, and teams 
uh, that have interesting ideas to come and play within the sandbox and they fund them and so on. I don't know whether you have those uh, mechanisms in Europe or you have alternatives. Uh, you might very well do, but I think those are good uh, measures to test it out. You know, don't study innovation because we aren't ready to regulate it. Yet. I think there are a plethora of sandboxes and connecting sandboxes one to the other. So I said there are questions. The man is waving. Everyone's waving their hands. So I'll, I'll come to that. So um, I saw the first question there, and then I saw okay, there, then sir, and then you. Okay, so if yeah. you introduce yourself. And yeah, um, Ramesh from uh, California, so Silicon Valley, and um, I work on high frequency standards and also have a startup on uh, tokenizing real estate. So um, if you look at the biggest application of uh, a business in the blockchain, consumer uh, market, right, is number one is exchanges. As, uh, as Peter pointed out, it's a new intermediary. Number two is now K AML, KYC checks. That's, they're making the second in terms of number of the revenue, right? Exchanges, AML, KYC, rest of it. I mean, blockchain is, you know, it's all about this intermediation, decentralization, but then most people cannot interact with blockchain. They have to go to the exchange. And I was at a talk in San Francisco, Coinbase, you know, it's one of the biggest exchanges. They're trying to make it even more user friendly so they can get more users to use it. Um, and then that's so one you, you need to come to a question yeah. because there'll be other cross questions. So, so the question is um, what do you think about uh, the stable coin? I mean, uh, there's a lot of stable coins coming up right now, and they're trying to basically uh, use it as an alternative currency backed by you know, USD or whatever, right? So, so I don't know if you guys, stable coins. Um... Of course, the problem with the other coins that are not stable coins is that they're so volatile that it's difficult to use them as a payment instrument because they even change in value between the moment you send them and the moment they arrive. So it's very difficult. System around that. Of course, if you have a stable coin, where does the ability come from? I know there's a model that sort of dynamically increases the volume or the, the volume of the coins. If the, if the, if the uh, value goes up, the volume goes down, and so on. How the precise it goes, I don't really know. But most of the stable coins we see, they are stabilized because they are a claim on some, they represent some real world asset. So then the question is, well, who's going to be the, who's the custodian of that real world asset? Is that asset safe? Is the asset really there? You see all kinds of stable coins and say, this token represents a dollar. That therefore implies that the issuer has that dollar somewhere and that you can have that dollar upon request. And does the issuer actually have it? So this raises this very traditional questions of financial regulation. Are these people really doing what they're doing or are they selling stake on it? So the intermediary. So, thank you very much for the question. It's quite by the um, by the by the stem microphone. No. 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 Can you project your voice in an operatic manner? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so, Arvin Smith. Um, I'm a blockchain entrepreneur, and I'm joining the Mobility Track later today to represent Mobi. The Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative. And my question um, kind of starts with a thought experiment. So let's imagine crypto assets take off in a variety of forms. So let's imagine that they will become useful, there will be adoption, the market cap will go up. And we have spent a fair amount of time talking about what the different characteristics are that make crypto assets so interesting. But my question to the panel is, what are the characteristics, in your mind, of fiat currency that will protect it against disruption in the next 10 years? Disruption from Bitcoin. From alternative from forms. Okay. Let's run down the panel from one end to the other. Should we start with Peter, run down? Well, the main characteristic of fiat currency is believe it's, uh, it's trust in the issuer and the fact that the central bank that issued it or the authority that issued it will stand behind its value and will show its value. That's 
the main characteristic it has for the rest has no other features. So that belief is very, very important. So did you, you subscribe to belief or do you go beyond? Beyond belief? You my, my answer precisely. No, it's, it's just, it's uh, most crypto assets, even some sort of stable coins, which use kind of an algorithm or backed by other mm. crypto assets and so on, they, they don't have a, have a real issue behind. And as long as you don't have someone who is responsible, who you can trust, and uh, who you, you can read a profile and you, uh, you grab the phone and, and act out, as long as this is not, uh, not there, it's difficult for, for uh, an asset to be used. And I think this is an open, always open to, to speculation and, uh, and there's a high risk entailed. So that is why the issue is, is, is of utmost importance in order for crypto assets to be used at, at large scale. I'm from Greece, and I have the experience of Greece and Cyprus during the crisis, when uh, we had uh, suddenly banks closing and uh, everybody losing their deposits, their savings. We in Greece uh, we had capital control, so for several years we could not use the money we worked for. So you understand that for me it's not the question; it's the evolution of uh, money. It's a new form of money, and more things than that. So I would say that uh, different things can exist at the same time, and um, I, I, they are backed by trust, but this doesn't mean that if you go to go to the banks now and try to get all the money that are supposed to be out there, they can actually pay for that. You know, we, we don't have the, the golden rule, the, the, the rule of gold. So they're not actually backed, it's trust. I would trust these transactions, and uh, it's, like a, it's like a contract with governments. So uh, after my experience in, in Greece and Cyprus, I think uh, this is an exciting technology as an option. And uh, I wouldn't even say, uh, let's, let's forget Europe, let's say for the, the countries that people cannot get a bank account. They cannot. They don't have an address. Um, they don't have electricity, they want to start a small business, they don't have access to uh, this kind of uh, regulation. They can use liquid wallets with small payments to actually start something. Um, for women that they are restricted from their families to work, they can actually have an ESOP, like to build something in their house, and they have their own wallet and they can do some payment, they can have some security, they can have something. So there are people that are not banked, and there are people that are banked and um, they cannot trust the banks, like, as I mentioned from our experience, even in Europe. So I think it's a very interesting um, 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 evolution of the form of money that we have to explore, and it's, uh, it's here to stay. Thank you, Mandy and Colin. Fiat versus Fiat's longevity will come from uh, trust, I fully agree, and regulations. So, you know, if the country just says, we can't trade in crypto, then that's the end of that. We have to protect it. And extend institutions are protected by that. Um, I think the main two things that push currency adoption are the ease of use of the network effects. Um, governments are able to mostly shortcut this by declaring what the currency is, and by that virtue, they can make the network effects happen really quickly. I think um, what Eva pointed out are two very important factors we talk about the positive influences of government on this thing, but there are places in the world where the government has a negative influence on people's ability to transact, specifically women in many countries. And this is something that they can use, the tool that they can use in order to escape that situation um, by virtue of the fact that they aren't using a government restricted um, unit of currency. So we've got uh, a minute of time, so last question then. So, so please introduce yourself and ask your question. Well, so, uh, I, I'm pointing it to you. You look like you want that question, but. Um, ah, okay, now I was just basically shaking my head, but now that I'm speaking, I actually, I actually do have a question. Okay. The first one I wanted to say is that, uh, so my name is Matthias, I work for the FCA, uh, the, the innovative department where we basically launched the first sandbox in the world in May 2016. So there's loads of activity uh, here in Europe um, and, and the UK specifically. Uh, Paul, you mentioned um, uh, uh, the fact that you're trying to sort of like outsource control with technology because then you can't give control to someone else. 
And I'm wondering, how do you think this, this is going to reconcile with regulation where you're trying to, to find an entity that's actually responsible? So we need a point of control that you know, is able to mitigate specific risks that may arise. Um, that is, yeah, um, yeah I, I think that the, the two properties that we want to make sure that there isn't able to be controlled are the money supply and the, the monetary policy inside our design because we think that that will be a never ending situation that will no one will be happy about it and we will argue about it forever. So by declaring that no one can make this um, decision, it simplifies that solution. We just come up with this supply and we do it. So regulations can come on storefronts. It's like you can't do this, you can't do X, Y, and Z, you can't set up an exchange, default on it, lose everyone's money. That type of thing can be done without my help. It can be done on top of my help. And so you're welcome. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eugene McGuire from Freshfields. Uh, you, you mentioned previously you would be a, kind of a different work stream on, on ICOs. Um, can you give us a bit more clarity on that? Is it a part of the work stream or is it with the Commission as well? And um, once you give some clarity, can some of the other speakers comment on the Commission? <laughs> you have insight so, um, on the, the crowdfunding file with. Uh, when the Commission was working on that, it had ICOs when it arrived to the European Parliament, it didn't. When we sent it back, it, uh, it did, but then in the end it was removed to be treated in a separate file as a separate case um, in order to proceed fast with the crowdfunding file. So um, hopefully it's coming very fast because everybody's willing to put an order there and give some certainty for the technology to evolve and uh, since it's a it's a platform, ICOs are platforms that you can use. You get liquidity in the market, and since the banks are overregulated, um, then we can have an option there to give the liquidity to you know, do SMEs and startups uh, to get their ideas uh, going and uh, be able to have to get funding, feeling safe. And at the same time, the FinTech Action Plan, we do have sandboxes now, so we try to work on the sandboxes that you mentioned. So in parallel, we're working on several things, trying to create you know, this union, hopefully, in this mandate, because I don't know what's happening in the next one that we're trying. I'm, I'm going to have to uh, cut it short. There may be uh, further questions. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to all of our panelists. I've got to say, I've done a lot of these, and I really enjoyed that one, but maybe that's just me. Um, so uh, lunch is uh, on offer. If we gather outside, if we have an escort, most of us down, uh, probably lose a few stokers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to the presenters.